welcome to the Medical Menemis Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. I'm very excited to introduce our next guest, Dr. Anthony Mativier. Through the Magnetic Memory Method, Anthony hosts some of the leading educational material on creating memory palaces, remembering names, faces, numbers, poems, and has interviewed some of the top mind map creators and mnemonic experts in existence. Dr. Mativier, how are you doing? I am excellent. Thanks for having me, Chase. Great. I'm so glad that we're able to schedule this after a couple of cups in the past, but I think this is going to be very beneficial for the students, especially just getting some of the basic points starting off memory palaces, but then also being one of the best educators that I've found on this material, you know how to train to a higher degree for students that are looking for something a little more or already have some experience in this material. So quickly, Is there anything else about you that you'd like to share prior or why you started the magnetic memory method and what makes it magnetic? Oh, great question, because the magnet metaphor really, really matters. And it matters because when I was in university, I was very, very depressed and my head was filled with all kinds of thoughts darting in and darting out like wild little animals. And anybody who's been in university, which I think your audience is definitely dealing with a lot of uh, school material, there's also doubts and all kinds of weird stuff that just enters the mind all the time. And then if you throw in clinical depression, which can accelerate all kinds of negative thoughts and so forth, finding memory techniques was a great antidepressant, so to speak, because I was able to not just stick information in place as if it was a magnet onto a fridge holding tickets to the concert, but I was able to use that magnetic force to repel all of the endless negative thoughts that were coming in due to the depression. And ultimately, it's not too much to say that it saved my life because I don't know what would have happened. I used to live right next to a very, very big bridge, which they eventually put a suicide barrier on. And I'll tell you, I had impulses to jump off that thing of the worst kind. and. Finding memory techniques gave me a different focus and really did repel a lot of that junk. Wow. And though we usually don't deal with too much of the mental health aspect, it's such a growing concern, especially in certain professions and certain educational environments, such as medical school. It's really enlightening to hear you say that this type of material, learning these techniques, might actually benefit them in more than just their schoolwork, but also in their mental health and personal skills as well. Yeah. And actually, I'm putting together the initial stages of a foundation that will help educate doctors about the role that memory training potentially can bring. And part of the initiative of the foundation will be to generate some funding around research to verify some of what I think will prove true. And some of it's just downright common sense. I mean, when you can't remember stuff, (laughs) you're definitely stacking the chips against yourself. And when you can memorize your stuff, you're creating almost certainly higher levels of dopamine. And if you do it as a ritualistic practice, so to speak, you're almost certainly creating myelin and other, you know, opioid receptors are starting to float around. And I don't have the massive budgets at the moment to do research around this with respect to memory training, but I do feel as a person who reads a lot of memory science that a lot of these researchers are not asking the kinds of questions I would like to see being asked and verified. And, you know, that's what science is. It's the confirmation of uh, claims. And I claim that there must be a boost. And if doctors would just say to young people like me, as I was back then, hey, have you ever done any memory training? It might save lives. In fact, I'm sure it will. Actually, we need to talk more about that at a later time. I know, especially Dr. Patrick Beeman, co-host at Inside the Boards podcast, is very, very interested in research and exploring different aspects of mental health for medical students. So that would be a good collaborative project. Oh, excellent. I will will look forward to that. So between your podcast, YouTube channel, books, online courses, both free, for pay, you have so much resources out there. Is there a starting point for students or the audience that hasn't really had too much experience in memory palaces yet? Yeah, absolutely. If you visit magneticmemorymethod.com, it's a site that makes it quite clear that there's a free course to take. 
And when you take that course, you will learn what I believe is a far superior means of creating memory palaces than what is commonly taught. The reasons for its superiority generally come clear to people who have struggled with the technique before. And if you haven't struggled with it before, then you get to save all that struggle because I had to struggle with it because a lot of the books never made sense to me. And no doubt, because they're usually written by memory competitors in the current uh, times. And so that's where I would start. There's a reason why I think the memory palace is the place to start. And that's because it uses spatial memory and autobiographical memory together in a very special way that enables you to use all the other memory techniques that will use many other levels of your existing memory so that you don't have to invent a bunch of new stuff all the time. And that's another thing about the magnetic memory method is, whereas a lot of the memory competitors, they're going to ask you to memorize stuff in order to memorize. I've changed it and put it completely the opposite. Don't memorize things in order to memorize. Use your existing competence with your existing levels of autobiographical, episodic memory, and so on down the line in order to reduce the cognitive load that memory techniques create to the absolute minimum. And that has helped many, many people tremendously because it creates greater speed, it creates greater efficiency. And because you're using existing mental content, you are able to personalize the information a lot faster and in a way that's a lot more fun. Um, that's an issue I still have, still being relatively novice to these techniques is just the cognitive load sometimes trying to make certain mnemonics uh, for certain topics. And it's so complicated, I just end up going back, reverting to the old way, which in the long run doesn't benefit me. It doesn't stick as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, rote learning is what I usually refer to as the blunt force hammer of learning. And no polyglot, for example, like I do a lot of language learning stuff as well. And I know a lot of polyglots and I've been to polyglot gatherings and conventions and so forth. None of them are really doing rote learning. They may talk about their index cards and their spaced repetition software and so forth. But the real deal uh, polyglots, they are never doing rote learning. They are always doing some sort of creative mnemonic engagement, even if they do have a heavy space repetition component. And that's very, very important to understand about what they're doing because they wouldn't get away with it if they were doing it uncreatively and not using memory techniques and mnemonics. And that's interesting. So for the audience, a polyglot is someone that's studying multiple language or learns multiple language, basically. Yes. And I know for medical terminology, we have to learn a lot of Latin, Greek, even a little French, a little this, a little that, depending on whoever created it, whatever language they spoke at the time. So it's not directly language learning, but it is related to the medical terminology and the prefixes and suffixes of different terminology that we have to remember. Do you think some of that could be implemented into our medical studies? Yeah, and it already is. I mean, there are many companies that will sell you medical mnemonics. I think they're totally bankrupt because that's not really going to work as effectively as you learning to create your own imagery and place it effectively in memory palaces. But yeah, it's there and it's just a matter of, of refining it. And the same thing sort of applies. I've talked to Alex Mullen many times and he's three times world memory champion and a medical student and a language learner. And he likes to use certain apps, Sketchy Medical, I believe it, it is called or was called mm -hmm. at a certain time. And like he's not opposed to using it, but he's using it from the perspective of a nemonist, a world memory champion. And so that kind of use gets you far, far different results than the namby-pamby use that the software just sort of out of the box says, hey, you know, here's some imagery. <laughs> it just, just doesn't really work. <laughs> And it can't. It actually cannot work nearly as well as just developing a solid memory practice. That's a good point. When uh, we had Alex on for episode two and three, Alex and Kathy, and then uh, right after that, Nelson Dulles, and sort of the impression I received when they were talking about these types of pre-made mnemonics, whether it be for medical or something else like sketchy medical or pigmonic, is you can use them to get a, a, a decrease your cognitive load, get some general ideas, but you really want to create your own in the end, especially for difficult topics that the pre-mades are not really working out for you that well. Right, right. Hey, and by all means, if a pre-made mnemonic works well, go with it. Don't, I'm not necessarily getting down on it to the point of being irrational. It's just, that's not the skill. 
and you will really quickly develop it if you just focus on developing it. And then you'll laugh at some of those other things and you'll think, how the, how the heck could that ever have worked? <laughs> <laughs> so developing the skill is still problematic for a lot of students. I know you get a lot of emails about this. Um, I still have a lot of trouble with certain aspects. Besides your free course, what would maybe be the next step if they're still having problems or maybe very specific problems for just one topic, just biochemistry or just anatomy? Do you have any mnemonics for those already or any sort of specific advice for that? Well, here's the thing. You could throw all kinds of stuff at me and I can do elaborate encoding of it, which is a term for creating mental imagery. And it really doesn't matter what the information is. People think that the information matters or that my information is special or my information is different. No, it's not. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the information. Think of it this way. A fishing rod and a hook really doesn't have that much to do with the act of fishing. Now, you might need a certain weight of fishing line and you might want you know bigger hooks for bigger fish, right? But at the end of the day, the actual basic raw mechanics of fishing doesn't care about the fish, right? It's just a tool with relation to the information. So the variations are very, very small. And that's the number one tip that I would have for medical students is don't think that there's anything special about your information. There isn't. It's just information. Memory techniques are just memory techniques. Bring the two together and learn how to use them and you will succeed. And then you'll see, oh my goodness, I could apply all this to Chinese. I could apply all this to every name in this room when I go to a party. It, it's really not that different. It really isn't. So you could throw a medical term at me and I can tell you about a guy I met named Gengador Dianand, you know, and I have met a guy named Gengador Dianand and I just would use the exact same tools as I would for, you know, ulna, is it called? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a medical person, but ulna, I think is the word I was looking mm -hmm. for there you know, tibia or something like this. I don't know. Whatever term you want to throw at me, I, I, I could figure something out. And it's no different than the name of a person. Okay. So just real quick, do the three main bones in the arm, the ulna, as you said, the radius, and then the humerus. Right. Radius and humerus. Okay. So, you know, you can think of a radio, for example, and maybe the radio has a, a USA sticker on it. Radius, right? <laughs> Humor, you said, was the other one? Correct. Well, your biceps are around the humerus and then your forearms oh, humorous, made of okay. the... So I just saw a band, Sadistic Humor, which is where now I have to add like a US sticker or something like this, right? Because I didn't quite uh, encode it quickly enough there to catch that last thing. Uh, and you'll notice too, I said ulna. What was it? Ulnar, I think it's called? Or ulna? Correct. Good. Ulnar. Yeah, like the ulnar nerve right, or right. ulnar, like when it's associated with that. So that kind of thing, right? Uh, I've never mm -hmm. actually memorized that. So I have to think about how I'm going to, you know, correct that if I want to correct that. So I don't go around saying ulna when I mean ulnar. And, you know, this is where having some language learning works because there's certain sounds in other languages that are ner, and I could draw upon that. Or I could think about what were they called? Nerf balls back when, back when I was a kid. Um, or I could think of a nerd, Revenge of the Nerds, the movie and so <laughs> forth. So humorous, radius, ulnar, right? Now I'm going to put those things in a memory palace. There may be a different way that I do it in a memory palace. Like I might do it horizontally. I might do it vertically. There is some space for doing it horizontally very rarely, but those words could go together. I could actually just look at a diagram of a human being and then have Batman standing in the corner and map that diagram of the human being onto Batman as if I could x-ray see through his body and the, where those bones are. And then I would just go to the next corner and have Batman. And now I'm going to look at, I don't know, parts of his skull in that next corner. And then I go to the next corner. Now I'm going to see with my x-ray vision through his shoulder. Then the next corner, I'm going to see into his chest. And I'm sure there's a bunch of words for all that, right? I don't know what they are, but I would then start to attach to him magnetically, you know, things like a radio with a US sticker on it or whatever it is whatever that word might be. It's that simple. It's, it, there's nothing more complicated about it than that. And it probably sounds very difficult when you're listening to someone explain it, but once you get the, the process down a little in your brain, once you're able to visualize more yourself, it makes more sense. I think that visualization is part of the problem because you don't need to visualize things, actually. 
not in the usual sense. You don't have to see this in your mind. You can feel it. You can feel things spatially where a corner is. You can think of the actual physical presence of Batman. You can, for example, if we were going to put the radius on him or the radio with the US sticker on him, we could actually feel what that would be like to hold, to be Batman and to hold that stereo or radio. We could hear what song was playing on there. And it might be the song Radio by the band Rancid, right? Just to grind it in. Because if you're trying to see it only, then you're really robbing yourself of the quick results. You want to hear a sound around it. You want to feel a physical sensation around it. If there's a smell and a taste that you can throw in there, all the better. If you can get a concept going. And uh, one of the problems we face too is, you know, you mentioned that it may be difficult when you're hearing it for the first time. I think that we are starting to become very sensitive to things that sound like they require effort more than ever before in history, but this is actually not difficult at all. And so what we need now to be adding a new layer of learning literacy to people, which is to notice their own increasing sensitivity to things that are not difficult, but just seem difficult because of the onslaught of information overwhelm. That is self-induced, actually, by carrying devices around that notify you all the time. I know you talk a lot about the uh, the cell phones, computers, just kind of making information so convenient to access and Google, and we're not using our memories enough, we're not training it enough, we're letting it just become weak and flabby in a way. Well, there's a so, term for it, which is de-skilling. Oh, yes. I think you mentioned that in, uh, was an interview with Barbara Oakley, maybe? She had mentioned the term to me. That's where I first heard it. Okay. And then I looked it up further. And, you know, she talked about it in the context of linguistic de-skilling. And congratulations, great memory, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, linguistic de-skilling, I think the story she told, she was in Antarctica or she had t read some research about people in Ant Antarctica who hadn't spoken for a very long time and they lost their mother tongue. And I'd experienced that myself in Germany, and I didn't really know the extent of it until I moved to Australia and started to hear English all the time. And I listened to my old podcast episodes, and I think I sound like an idiot, which may have helped the success of the podcast, given the dumbing down of culture <laughs> around the world. I don't know. But uh, uh, it seems to be still growing, <laughs> even though my vocabulary has returned. Um, but yeah, it's a real, real issue. And it sickens me to the core because this stuff is not that difficult but yet people are experiencing a lot of pain. And speaking of Barbara Oakley, she talks in a book of hers called Mind Shift about the insular cortex and how that it creates a kind of pain response in the brain whenever people face a situation of needing to make an effort and that, that that's quite natural. And I have no disagreement that, that that may be so. Other than that, we have an entire history of the human species bucking up and getting the work done anyway. So I don't, you know, see any excuses. And if I have a flaw, it's that I don't even accept excuses from myself and certainly not from any of my students. And I will often write people when they have excuses, you know, you've just got to dive in, create the habit, let the brain chemicals do their work like dopamine and myelin sheaths and all this great neurochemical stuff that will happen if you're just consistent and persist. I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care what your story is. I don't care about any of that stuff. Do the work. The results will follow. And don't listen to the story that your brain is telling you that it's too hard. Because if, if I listened to that story, there would be no Magnetic Mary Method podcast. I never would have gotten a PhD. And uh, we wouldn't be talking right now. And I have had that story probably a hundred times worse than the average person gets because of having suffered clinical depression. And it's not a true story, no matter how hard you get hit with something like that. Wow. And uh, actually, now you've given me some more topics to speak with Dr. Oakley about on uh, an upcoming interview with her. So that's going to be great. Excellent. <laughs> I know she mentioned Peak in that interview too, which I find to be one of the most influential books on learning education and really explains that yeah, learning is difficult. It's not supposed to be fun. If you're having fun, you might be doing something wrong. So you just have to push through it and, and use that deliberate practice and persistence to really get it down, get the habits down, learn the material. Well, that's the irony though, right? Is if you use memory techniques, you instantly make it fun. As long as you don't listen to the story of like, oh my goodness, I have to create a memory palace. And then I have to think about a radio with a US sticker on it. Like people do that. 
They come with this sort of sob story. I'm like, are you kidding? This is the most exciting mental adventure you can have. This is like <laughs> having Disneyland on tap in your mind 24 seven. And you can just go on every roller coaster ride that there is with every piece of information. Don't make this a chore. It's not. It's an amazing, fun, exciting time. And it turns every second of learning into the adventure of a lifetime. I guess that's the the mindset. If you're looking at it as work, as a chore, then it loses its intrinsic funness. You know, it's intrinsic excitement to it. If you're doing it for the peer and simple fact that you like the material, that you have the time, you're not under a deadline, then mm. it seems you're you're more likely to think of it in a different way, a different mindset. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I don't mean to fly in the face of reality. Certainly there are people with all kinds of struggles and they have real issues that impede their minds and yada yada yada. But At the end of the day, I think it comes back to this growing sensitivity to what information is that I don't think previous generations had to contend with. And so I may have had some luck in my life because when I was doing my PhD, as tough as things were, YouTube was just a minor little thing that was kind of goofy to go and watch once in a while on dial up that would take, you know, 40 minutes to render up two seconds of a video. So it wasn't impeding (laughs) the brain back then in the same sense that it it may be now. And I recognize that. But there's some simple solutions. And even last night I was out with some people and we were leaving and the the my friend Martin, he was like, oh I'll just get an Uber. And I thought it was a little bit too late to to get any buses or anything. And I said, well I'm gonna have to walk because I not only do I not have the Uber app. But I don't even have a means of downloading it right now because I'm digital fasting. So, you know, (laughs) while all of you guys are looking at your cell phones 450,000 times during this event, I only have one thing to do, which is pay attention to the speaker. And that's very, very important to me because if I didn't have digital fasting, I would be just like everybody else, which is a dopamine slave to my device. And I don't want that. And I don't think any Mm. medical student should want that either. Yeah, it's very distracting trying to set up your study environment if you keep that phone too close to you. You're going to look at it nonstop and not really focus on what you need to focus on. Right, right, exactly. And, and you know, I, I just shudder to think of the the great wave of medical professionals yet to come who can't focus on their patients, you know. It's hmm. Not being able to focus on your studies is one thing, but look at the field you're going into. You need to be very deep and present with people. And sometimes you got to read between the lines of what I'm not a doctor, but I just assume that you need to read between the lines of what people are saying and what they mean, because sometimes what they say and what they mean are two different things. And if you're tethered to a device and your attention span is three seconds or less, you know, you might want to think about your coming proficiency in that field. That could be a scary thought. (laughs) (laughs) So I know you bring up sleep health, meditation, fitness as different parts of uh, uh, influencing your training, your practice, and helping memory in general, which I believe there's a lot of science behind that too. Would you mind going into just the basics of what you do and the benefits that one could see from those types of practices? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, depending on your age, there's some recent research that sleep consolidation doesn't help memory after 45 or 50. But if you're a younger person, it's still wild, widely considered that sleep helps consolidate memory. So it really makes sense to take care of your sleep. I wish that I had. It was certainly part of the problem for many years of my life that I didn't take care of sleep. I'm even a bit sleep impaired right now because I was out last night, but it was for a worthy cause. And uh, it's rare that I'm not in bed at 7 p.m. So I, I, I only had a few hours sleep. Uh, and it's actually showing in my, in my cognitive process to myself, if it's not evident to you. But sleep is huge and diet as well. And one of the reasons diet I have come to feel is so critical to memory is because I've had struggles with chronic pain for a long time, which I've managed to manage down to almost insignificance. And my observation is that if you can't pay attention, you can't really remember information. And if you're in pain, your attention is very, very impaired because you're so inverted into your own body and and your pain that you're not, or at least in my experience, not as outwardly focused to receiving and observing the kinds of information that you would want to memorize at the level of detail that you would want to remember it. So anything that you can do around diet to remove inflammation, and we know that a lot of parts of the body, like the brain, for example, 
can get inflamed and you won't even physically feel it, but you'll feel the effects of the, or you'll suffer the consequences of an inflamed brain nonetheless, even if you don't have pain in your brain. Anything that you can do to reduce inflammation will almost certainly create a memory benefit. And so that, oddly enough, is not so much what you would add to your diet, but what could you take away from your diet, which I think is probably the first focus before you worry about blueberries and salmon and green tea that you could add to your diet. Because green tea, you know, could potentially lead to acid reflux, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what could you take away as opposed to what are you going to add is very, very important. And I know some people speak in favor of memory supplementation. I've never seen anything that gives better than a 0.05 verbal memory advantage. You get that from just drinking enough water. So again, what could you take away from your diet as opposed to what you could add? And then the next thing to be covered, obviously, is fitness, physical fitness. And I think it's just obvious the more healthy your body is comprehensively, the healthier your brain is, the more you can pay attention. And when you use memory techniques, the more you're likely to just use them without getting this, oh, it's too much effort story going on in your head because you're a person who willfully goes and submits yourself three or five times a week, whatever it is, to putting effort into push-ups, lifting something heavy. You know, you're just not that sensitive to effort because you're a fit person. You're forming those positive habits and they can bleed into other aspects of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, but the, 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 the answer to making your life better is just pretty simple <laughs> common sense, um, which is one of the hardest cells in the world these days. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it always is. <laughs> I know you're an uh, avid meditator as well. Mm. Do you prefer certain types of meditations and the frequency? Uh, what would some recommendations for students be there? That's a great question because there's a huge problem in the meditation world that actually is easy to solve. And that is that meditation is a word that is an umbrella term for many, many different activities. And some research that I read recently was very, very compelling to me from my own lived experience, because it turns out, according to this research, that men tend to be attracted to very intellectual meditation pursuits, which are exactly the kinds of meditation pursuits that will lock them out of achieving the goal that they're seeking which would be the reduction of thoughts, greater focus, clarity, liberation, etc. And women tend to be attracted to the kinds of physical meditation activities, which may or may not lock them out of the goal they're trying to achieve. But it's actually men that were most likely to benefit from movement-based meditation in terms of the cessation or the reduction of thought and greater focus and clarity. And that was really important in my own lived experience because for years I sat just to sit in, in the sort of, you know, Alan Watts way of thinking of things and <laughs> really just experiencing the mind. Shikantaza is what the actual term is for sitting just to sit and, you know, not having any thoughts and really just focusing on sitting. But that I now know locked me into a part of my brain that was really robbing me of the deep ocean of calm that was possible if I would just do a bit of yoga stretching and a bit of chanting, which was completely counterintuitive to me. And it's the subject of a book that I've just finished and handed over to the editor, which is all about all these things, diet and, and, and whatnot, but specifically about meditation for memory and understanding that there's a spectrum of activities and no one really knows which they're going to respond to the best unless you practice as many as you can and put some time into each one and then understand that the effects and benefits of these individual kinds of meditation, they will come and go. So you almost want to think of it as a rotating kaleidoscope of different meditative activities. So none of them burn out or none of them sort of, you know, tap out, but you are always refreshing the, uh, the different kinds of meditation activities to continually deepen the results. And there's an interesting researcher named Jeffrey Martin who's sort of identified what he, what he calls eight different levels of PNSE, which is persistent non-symbolic experience. And he finds in there that there's a variety of ways to get to those different eight levels. And my finding on top of that in my own experience is that the more of the different kinds of meditation you explore, the more likely you're going to land at one of them, if not several of them. Interesting. I, I know I've studied and practice several different types of meditation in the past, but I didn't really know too much about the differences until getting into each one. 
And it, it seemed like there's a lot of dogma behind certain ones. They say that they're the best and just the best at everything, or the science only shows this side and not that side. And yeah. I always advocate the same thing, sort of switch it up, try different ones. And this one works better when I need to accomplish this task. That one works better if I need to do this activity next. Yeah. 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 Well, my book is using spiritual texts, memorizing spiritual texts for a secular purpose. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do that is because I'm pretty much in the Sam Harris school of meditation. Waking up is an amazing app. If you want to try it, I actually broke my own uh, no app policy just to to try it because I wanted to see what he did. It turns out it's just an audio book in the form of an app. But in any case, um, <laughs> well worth going through. Uh, and, you know, he's very, very on the secular thing. And he's even, you know, restricted the amount of books that he will recommend people read from the ancient tradition or some of the earlier 20th century writings because he doesn't want people to fall into those dogmatic traps. And I get that. But I then actively sought it out. I'd heard him mention Advaita at one point, And then that term kept coming. Advaita Vedanta is a particular tradition that is actually fairly free of uh, religious woo-woo. But nonetheless, I submitted myself into it. And I memorized an entire section, 32 verses of the Ribhu Gita, which is an ancient text. And it has a lot of, you know, kind of spiritual leaning sort of stuff, but I wanted to see what would happen anyway. And I just, I've been through the roof in terms of focus and concentration, and then being able to remember a heck of a lot more, a lot faster from the practice of memorizing that stuff, because I had to memorize it in English and in Sanskrit. And it takes me, I don't know, I did it on a live stream the other day, eyes closed, and I'm not even sure how long that it took, but I imagine it's about 10 minutes of reciting this, these 32 verses. And now I just kept on memorizing and adding more and more and more. And the more I do it, the more benefits I get. And we know that singing creates higher levels of, what is it called, cortisol in the body, um, which can promote he healing. Hmm. Um, so that might be part of the, the good feelings that emerge. I don't know. But in any case, as much as I can, I have protected myself against the spiritual woo-woo, as I would call it. And yet I think I can <laughs> deeply understand now why people get so religious about it because i've switched on all that stuff just by doing the practice and so you know it's a, it's a bit of like internal fact checking that becomes a bit of a job but man i wouldn't replace these good feelings for the world <laughs> well that's really cool i definitely need to add a link to that live stream as well or, or any um related podcasts and youtube videos you have on these topics i'm sure the audience will find very very informative And that'll do it for part one of this interview with Anthony Mativier of the Magnetic Memory Method. Please join us for part two, where Anthony will cover the tips, tricks, and actual strategies to creating your own powerful magnetic memory palaces. Also, don't forget that the Medical Nemesis podcast will be joining the Inside the Boards podcast for the AMSA convention in Washington, D.C., March 7th through 10th. So, if you will be attending, please come by our booth. I think it's been moved to 74 now. So swing on by, ask us questions, pick up some swag, have fun. Let's meet in person. See you then.